Welcome to the Compass Christian Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information, visit us at compasslu.org. Well, good morning. As Ari has been said, we're going through a new series with our motto, Following Jesus Together. And so today I think we'll be looking at the most important part of that motto, which is the middle word, Following Jesus Together. I think we can agree we could get the following down correct, we could get the together part correct, but if we're following Buddha together, (laughs) the results are going to be a little bit different than what we're trying to accomplish here. So this morning we're answering the question, who is Jesus? And so we're going to be looking at what does the Bible say about him? And I think when we think about in the context of following Jesus, what exactly about him makes him worthy of following? So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Um, So, who is Jesus? Um, It seems like an easy question, but there are going to be a few layers of meaning we're going to unpack and sort out as we journey through the Bible looking at that question. And I just, you know, many of you know, uh, I've got a big team of lawyers behind me here at Compass, and one of the things that the lawyers, (laughs) one thing the lawyers always tell me is you have to bring your caveats out at the front, make sure people know how restricted things are in the sermon. So, I'm not going to be able to say everything about Jesus in the Bible in 30, 35 minutes. It's just not possible. So we're going to cover the ground that we can. Uh, and it's not a lot, but it's, it's what we can do in one sermon. So uh, we're going to start in the beginning. So if you want to take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 3, that's where we'll begin. Uh, we're going to start this morning with the Messianic expectation. And throughout the what we call the Old Testament um, or throughout the Hebrew Bible, there was a coming figure who God promised, uh, and he promised this coming figure using a variety of different information, a lot of different ways God describes who this coming figure would be. And so we're going to learn about this coming figure, a couple different angles about this coming figure by going through some of these texts. So we're going to start in Genesis. This is the beginning of the story of the people of God. And in the book of Genesis, the first thing that God does is he creates the world. And then what he does is he puts human beings into the garden. And eventually, Adam and Eve defy God. They choose their own path instead of following the path that God laid out for them. And so God takes action to prevent further calamity. And so he's driving, When we're going to read a, a section here where he's driving, he's about to drive Adam and Eve from the garden. He's going to, in some sense, separate himself from humanity. Uh, but there is a promise that God gives, not to Adam and Eve, actually. He gives this promise to his enemy. And this is the first bit of information we get about this coming figure. In verse 15, Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So here's the first bit of information we get about this coming figure. The the figure is going to be the seed of the woman. So this is going to be a human person. Uh, the, The next thing we learn is that the devil is going to bruise his heel but the damage would not be as severe or as permanent as the damage that the coming seed is going to do to the devil. He's going to bruise the head. And I think we can see looking back, they wouldn't have seen this in the, you know, reading this for the first time or hearing it for the first time, but looking back at it, we can see that this is a veiled reference to the crucifixion that we just talked about last week. Because he was damaged, but then it was not permanent damage. God got him up three days later. So throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible, God continues to reveal himself more and more and more. Eventually, he calls a man named Abraham out of idolatry to serve him. Eventually, Abraham's family goes down to Egypt as a tribe of about 70 people. They return to the land that God promised Abraham several generations later as a much larger group. And they have someone leading them throughout that period of time, and that person was Moses. So if you want to turn with me to Deuteronomy... Deuteronomy chapter 18. This is another prophecy about this coming figure uh, that God gives to Moses. Now Moses in the Hebrew mind, even to this day, the Jewish mind to this day, is one of the large figures of the Bible. Um, He's incredibly important. And so when we read this text, I think it's important for us to understand Moses was the one who gave the law. 
that's a huge part of what um, God wanted his people to receive and a huge, just a huge ministry to have, a huge responsibility to have to be interceding for the people during this really early time in their uh, uh, identity as a nation. And so he's, he's got this prophet who's, who's he's received the law, he's given this law, um, he's led the people through some of the most difficult times in the nation of Israel's uh, time. He's leading them out of slavery into the promised land. I mean, there's, there's so much going on here. The Exodus theme is a huge theme throughout the Bible. And what God shows Moses and what Moses uh, actually quotes God, we're going to see, to the people is that there's going to be a, a future prophet promised like Moses. So in Deuteronomy 18, verse 5, it says, The Lord Yahweh, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord Yahweh, your God, at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh, my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. I want to pause here really quick. There's a couple things I want to point out. There was this uh, time in Exodus where they come out of Egypt and God says, I'm going to have this meeting with you on the mountain. And the people come and they see the fire and they hear the voice of God and they get so freaked out that they decide, nope, I don't want anything more to do with that. And so that's when God changes from trying to uh, mediate his presence directly to working solely through a prophet. And in that time, that prophet was Moses. And so we have to go, we have to understand that what the people of Israel have gone to is they've, they've, they were a corporate body that at one time basically had some sort of connection with God, that God felt comfortable addressing the body of, of Israel directly. And now they've got a delegated representative, a, a human prophet. And so in addition to that, what we see is, is that uh, God is going to raise up a prophet like Moses from among the brothers. He's going to be a future Israelite prophet, a human prophet. And then the other bit of information that we're actually going to focus on more next week is, it is to him that we should listen. And that goes for the people of Israel, but it goes for us today. That's just a nugget anticipating next week when we talk about following Jesus. It's to him we shall listen. All right, verse 17 and Yahweh said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. So this is uh, Moses now quoting Yahweh. Verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So here we see the importance of listening to that prophet. That prophet is going to have the words of Yahweh in his mouth, and he's going to speak what God commands him to speak. And so if you do not listen to him, there are consequences to that. So just to recap a little bit so far, what we saw is that in Genesis, we saw that the coming figure was going to be the seed of the woman. He was going to be a human being. In Deuteronomy, we find out that this human being is going to be a prophet like Moses and that he is going to, in some sense, mediate between Yahweh and the people of God on God's behalf. He's, he's going to be chosen from among the people of Israel and that Yahweh will put his words into the mouth of this prophet and that all people should listen to this prophet because of that. If you want to, you can turn with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, we're going to get another piece of information. We're sort of taking a quick tour through the Hebrew Scriptures to see what, what they understood about this coming figure. And so just to briefly bring us up to speed, time goes on. The people go into the promised land. Uh, they possess it. They experience ups and downs in the times of the judges. You know, there were good times and they, when they were obeying God and things went great. Then they start forgetting. The good times make you sometimes forget about what got you to those good times, right? So they experience bad times. They start going into idolatry. Then they get taken over by various tribes around them uh, and experience captivity on some level. So that cycle sort of continues for a little bit. And eventually they ask for a human king. Now to that point, God had been their king. And even though they had asked for this prophet to mediate between them and him, God still viewed him, uh, viewed himself as their king. And this prophet was like a lower figure that mediated between God as king and the people. But eventually Israel says, look, every nation around us, they have a human king. We want a human king too. And so God says, okay, I'll give you a human king. You're not going to like some of the results of that, but I will do that if that's what you want. 
And so the first human king is Saul, who ultimately is a failure. And Saul's failure in the end is, is that he caves to the desires of the people instead of listening to God's commands through his prophet Samuel. So God ends up replacing Saul with David. But David has to wait for his turn. Uh, he has to hide in caves and do all sorts of crazy stuff for a period of time. Uh, and his life, because of that, is filled with war and violence. And so uh, in sort of the middle of David's life, uh, David decides, you know, I want to build a permanent dwelling place for God. Um, and so to that point, you know, going back a little bit to Moses, Moses instructs the building of the tabernacle. It was this tent. God's presence would come down into the tent. Uh, they had this way of worshiping and sacrificing through this tabernacle. And so at some point, the tabernacle gets parked in a couple different spots, but eventually it ends up in Jerusalem. And, and David's sort of recognizing, look, I live in this house of cedar. I live in this castle. I'm this king. I have all this authority. I have all this money. I have all, all this power, right? And I look out my window of my castle, and I see this little tent that God's living in. He's like, this isn't right. And so he goes to the prophet Nathan, and he says, you know, I want to build um, a dwelling place for God. And Nathan originally says yes before he goes and talks to God about it. He says, yes, David, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And then as Nathan's walking out, God tells him, actually, no, I don't want him to do that. So Nathan has to go back to David and says, no, uh, you're not going to do it. Your son's going to do it. And so that's the section that we're picking up here in 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're sort of picking it up in the middle for time's sake, but this whole chapter is just amazing. It's his, uh, Yahweh's covenant with David's being expressed here. And in verse 10, it says, And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will uh, plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, Yahweh declares to you that Yahweh will make you a house. So there's a couple things here. We talked about that cycle during the time of judges where there was good times and bad times. And he says, uh, Yahweh says to David through the prophet Nathan here that God's going to prepare a place for Israel and plant them permanently in that place. This is a promise uh, so that they will dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more, and violent men shall no, afflict them no more, as formerly during this time of the judges, when things were good and then they were bad, and there's all this violence and fighting all the time. And so God promises to give rest from all the enemies. But I want to point out here, at the end of verse 11, it says, Yahweh declares to you that Yahweh will make you a house. As my friend Sean Finnegan is fond of saying, you know, David goes to God, I want to build you a house. And then God goes back to David, no, I'm going to build you a house. <laughs> <laughs> so God here is trying to like one up, I guess, David in some sense, right? He's like, I'm going to build you a house. But this wasn't going to be a physical house that got built. He's talking about a line of kings that culminates, we're going to see, with a, a future king. Verse 12, it says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. Huh, that's interesting. That sounds like a familiar word we've seen before. Who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever." And so there's some things here that we have to unpack a little bit. The initial fulfillment of this was Solomon. Uh, Solomon was David's son, and Solomon did build a physical temple for God to dwell in. So there is that level of it. And so when we read stuff like, when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, that's really talking about Solomon. That's not talking about this coming uh, king. But it also says that someone, a son of his, is going to have a, his throne established forever. And then later in verse 16, it says, um, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So when this coming king comes, he's going to sit on the throne of David and he's going to reign on that throne forever. So that is the next picture that we get about this coming king. So again, to, to recap a little bit, we have Solomon building the first temple of Yahweh, and that stood until the time of the exile. 
And then the people of Israel did experience unparalleled peace during the reign of Solomon. Solomon was not a man of war like his father David. But these things foreshadow for us a greater fulfillment in Jesus. And we've already talked about in our kingdom series how Jesus is building the temple now. He is building a house now for God. And so th- there's, a lot, there's a lot going on here. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we see, too, that God continued to work in and through this line of David when there were good kings. There were good kings that came in the line of David, uh, even though there weren't many of them <laughs> as much as we would have wanted. But again, the ultimate fulfillment of all this that we're reading right now, the ultimate fulfillment of this is in Jesus. Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the promised king. Jesus is the one who is building the house of God, even as I speak. Jesus is the one who will reign at God's right hand forevermore. Jesus is the one who will share God's throne forever. Jesus is the one through whom God's steadfast love will shine throughout eternity upon those who follow him. So this text, this prophecy is about Jesus. So we've seen already he is the seed of the woman. He is uh, promised to come from a woman. We saw that he was the prophet, the intermediary like Moses who would mediate for Yahweh's people. We've seen that he is the coming king. Um, These are all very positive, powerful things, right? Let's go to Isaiah 53. Because there's something else about this coming figure that we need to know. There's many wonderful things that we've already read that are worthy of following. But I think uh, this is where we get a more complete picture of what it means to follow Jesus. In Isaiah 53, um, this is a passage talking about the suffering servant of Yahweh. And we're going to read a large portion of this. Starting in verse 3, it says, He, referring to this coming figure, he was despised and rejected by men. This is interestingly past tense for a future thing. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to, to the slaughter, like a sheep that, is, that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This, by the way, was the scripture that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading when Philip came on his chariot. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out, off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of Yahweh to crush him, he has been put to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So here again, we see intercession, but we see it from a different perspective. We see it from the perspective of someone who is willing to die to have that position of intercession for us. And so that's what, it, I mean, this is talking about Jesus. It's talking about the crucifixion specifically and what the crucifixion means for us today. So when we read Isaiah 53, I think it's, especially after reading 2 Samuel 7, it's a complete change. It's a complete, I mean, it's, it's like, oh, I was going this direction, then whoop, just make a complete left turn, right? Because I just told you he was a promised coming king, right? But he's also the servant. And I think that can help us get a greater understanding of why the Jews in the first century had a hard time with this message. 
Wait, you're telling me that this king that's supposed to sit on Solomon's and David's throne forever is going to be killed? That he's going to die? They actually thought that there were two different messiahs. There was this idea of the messiah ben David, who is the king, and the messiah ben Joseph, who was this suffering figure. They thought there would be two different people. They thought there would be one guy that would do the king thing, and there would be one guy who would do the suffering servant thing. Which is why when Jesus told his disciples, yep, I'm going to be, I'm going to have to go to the chief priest, I'm going to get beaten up, I'm going to get killed, but I'm going to be back, I'm going to rise the third day. They were like, nope, that's not what 2 Samuel 7 says. If you're the guy from 2 Samuel 7, you're not dying, right? That's what they were thinking. But here's the thing, Jesus is both. He's both. Let's see how this plays out a little bit in his life. What do we know about the life of Jesus? Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. The first thing we read is is that he was the seed of the woman. And we find out in Luke chapter 1 and in Matthew chapter 1, specifically which woman it was going to be. It was this woman named Mary. And uh, in Luke chapter 1 verse 30, it says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Again, this is where we learn his name, too. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Huh, I think we just read about that, didn't we? And the Lord God will give to him the throne of what? His father, David. This is citing very clearly 2 Samuel 7. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, how long? Forever. Forever. And of his kingdom, there will be what? No end, right? This is, this is straight out of the 2 Samuel 7 playbook here. Mary's question is a good one in the next verse. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, in other translations, it says, for that reason, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, in 2 Samuel 7, we saw that he was called the Son of God for, because he was the coming king. But here, we get another bit of information why he's called the Son of God. He's not just the Son of God because he fulfills 2 Samuel 7. He does fulfill 2 Samuel 7. He will fulfill it in the future even more, to a greater degree. But the other reason why he'll be called the Son of God is because God has to act for him to come into being. And that's what the angel's saying here. In Luke chapter 2, we learn a little bit more about Jesus' life. Um, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He grew up in Nazareth. Uh, The Bible doesn't tell us much about his childhood, uh, but we do learn a little bit about uh, a glimpse of what it looked like at age 12 Jesus uh, here in Luke chapter 2. In verse 41, it says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. Uh, To give a little bit of context here, we just read Luke 1. Uh, where the angel told Mary exactly who this boy was going to be. Now, Mary knew more than anyone else that this was not a natural conception process, right? So she would have known who this boy was. Uh, We didn't read Matthew 1, but we also find out in Matthew 1 that Joseph knew who this boy was going to be, and that's why he didn't divorce or separate from Mary or have her stoned or anything else that he could have opted to do. Uh, he instead decided to father this child as if this was his own child. So these are two people who know (laughs) 2 Samuel 7. They know Deuteronomy 18. They know Genesis 3. And they know they've lost the boy who's going to fulfill all of that. (laughs) So can you imagine what that conversation, we joke about conversation, you know, that conversation in the car would have looked like driving back to Jerusalem, right? They weren't driving cars back to Jerusalem, but... I thought, I thought he was with this. I thought, how do we lose this kid, you know? Oh, man. That would have been a rough uh, couple of times. And, and, you know, in God's grace and mercy, it took them three further days, it says in verse 46. They, they, God didn't just, like, shine a light, you know, boom, this is where he is. They dealt with this for three days plus the day that they traveled. So that's four total days uh, dealing with all this anxiety. Okay, verse 46. After three days, they found him in the temple. Whose house is that? 
That's his father's house. Yeah, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? Other translations have about my father's business. Verse 50, and they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. It's a remarkable uh, glimpse into his life uh, because what we see here is that by the age of 12, he was so full of knowledge and wisdom about the scriptures that he was interacting with People in our day, we would say we would have like doctorates in theology. He's interacting with the doctors of theology and he's, he's on an, essentially a, a level playing field. He's asking them questions, they're asking him questions, and they're astonished with his understanding of the scriptures and how he's uh, dealing with them, how he's asking questions and how he's answering them. And over time, it says l- later here, it says in the next verse that he increased in wisdom. He increased in wisdom over time. He had to develop this. And he increased in wisdom in favor with God and man, not just in favor with other people, but he had to grow in favor with God as well. And, and we find out here, just like other Hebrew children, he had to be subject to his parents. He was subject to his parents because he was still 12. He was still in their house. So later, the, a lot of the rest of the Gospels describe his ministry, his time of ministry before his death. And we've been talking about that some in our kingdom series. And of course, many of us are familiar with the Gospels. We don't have time today to unpack everything that he did. But I do want to go to Acts 10. There's a one verse synopsis uh, that Peter gives about his Lord's ministry. And I'm actually going to read it from the REV, our friends at the, at the REV. I think they do a good job here. In Acts 10.38, it says, Jesus, the one from Nazareth, because there are many Jesuses. I mean, Yeshua, Joshua, essentially, was a very common name in that culture. So Peter's, he's saying, look, this is the Jesus I'm talking about. Jesus, the one from Nazareth, how God appointed him with Holy Spirit and with power, and he went around doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And so during his ministry, during his time on this earth, Jesus did a number of things. He preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. He healed people. He cast out spirits. He raised the dead. He taught his disciples how to follow his example, especially his example of service through love. And as we briefly talked about last week, this ends with Jesus' death. His ministry ends with his death. uh, And then he was raised again the third day. So we've talked a lot about what the messianic expectation was. We've talked a little bit about who Jesus was during his uh, life on this earth, his, his first life. But the question isn't just who was Jesus or who is Je- was Jesus supposed to be. The question is who is Jesus? And so to answer that question, we're going to start with Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. This is one of the last things that he tells his disciples. So what, who is Jesus? What is he doing today? What is his role in the church? Uh, after his death and resurrection, which we talked about last week, there was this period of time for 40 days uh, before the day of Pentecost when he was uh, on this earth showing himself to his disciples and still instructing them. And right before his ascension, this is what he told his disciples to do. In Matthew 28, Verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What human being could say that before he said that? (laughs) What human being can say that after he said that? (laughs) He's the only one. He's the only one who's been given that authority in heaven and on earth. He's the only human who was worthy of that. So his instruction to his disciples in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, what I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with his church. He's active in his church even to this day. He has been glorified. He has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. 
And he, as we're going to see next week even in more detail, he commanded his disciples to make disciples. And that is the way that we duplicate what Jesus did and how we can live like him in this world. We disciple ourselves to people who follow Jesus, and we disciple others who also want to follow Jesus. That's how it works. But that's for next week. That's for next week. But as we carry out this mission, the point for this week, who is Jesus? The point this week is, as we carry out this mission, Jesus is with us. Christ is with us as well. We're going to close in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5. We don't have uh, Jesus' day timer. We don't know what his, <laughs> what his day-to-day life looks like. Uh, we don't have his calendar. He didn't share that with me on Outlook. Um, I wish he w- would. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, Google Docs. Yeah, I wish I, wish, uh, I wish I had some of that information, but I don't. Um, I just know that he's active. That's all I know. The Bible describes it in a number of different ways. We're going to look at just one verse here in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, but he is active. He is doing things. And um, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29, here's one example of it. It says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So here we see that Jesus right now is nourishing and cherishing the church. Now, what that means in a practical sense, the Bible doesn't tell us. Doesn't tell us the ins and outs of all that that means. Here in Ephesians, it says that he gives gift ministries. That's one of the ways that he nourishes and cherishes his church. But there are, I'm sure, many other ways that he does that. In Revelation chapter uh, 2 and 3, uh, Jesus gives specific information to John through an angel about seven historical churches and what they needed to change to be more successful. I call that nourishing and cherishing the church, right? And here's some other things. I'm, we're not going to go to these verses, but here's some other things that the Bible says that Jesus is doing right now. He's adding to the church. Uh, he appeared to apostles, and he can appear to others even to this day. He gives ministries and authorities. He makes intercession for us. He gives specific revelation. He encourages us. He loves us, and he gives us peace, grace, and mercy. So while we don't understand everything that Jesus is doing right now, we can understand it in the context of what we read in Deuteronomy 18, can't we? He is still acting like Moses, interceding for the people, interceding for the people of God, and helping them to experience the fullness of the goodness that God wants for them. He is still the coming king who is going to sit on the throne of David forever. So I'm sure he has a lot going on. (laughs) There are lots of ways to practically fill that out. We don't have all the details, but I can tell you, he's, I'm sure he's incredibly busy. So, who is Jesus? Jesus is the seed of the woman. Jesus is the prophet like Moses. Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the promised king. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, not our bosses, especially not ourselves. He is Lord. And Jesus is a suffering servant, but he doesn't suffer anymore. Jesus is the one witnessed about in Scripture. Jesus, he's the only human worth following completely. That's who Jesus is. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for all the things that you've done throughout the history of, the, of your people, starting with Adam and Eve in the garden and how you set forward a plan of redemption for us, how you unveiled the ministry of Moses and how he interceded and saved the people during that time so many times from themselves. And then, Father, for you calling a king and how we see that in the lives of people like David and Solomon and the other good kings. And for how Jesus fulfills all of that, how he, he still intercedes for us. He still reigns. He has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. How he suffered for us willingly, knowing Isaiah 53, knowing what he'd have to go through. And he still did it because he saw that that would lead to your greater good, this future kingdom that we've been talking about, and the life that we can live in this time because of it, the blessing of the Spirit, and all the things that you've made available to us in this time because of what he did and has done and continues to do in your service, God. So today we're just overwhelmingly thankful for the ministry of your Son.
and how we can serve underneath him. It's in his name that we pray this morning. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Compass Christian Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information on how we are striving to follow Jesus together here in Louisville, Kentucky, check out our website, compasslu.org, where you can subscribe to our newsletter and view additional resources.